It's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker of the day, Anthony Clement. He'll be speaking about an algorithmic solution of the conjugacy problem in a certain generalized free product. Anthony. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and thank you for thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so we can begin. Uh, so here's an abstract. Uh, this was inspired by uh, G. Gilbert's paper on generalized free product. So the key here is that we'll consider a certain type of cyclically pinched generalized free product, and uh, through a constructive process, we'll show that it's residually free. So uh, again, Gilbert, the result also in Gilbert's paper showed that it was residually free, but this would be done in a slightly different way. Um, uh, we'll utilize this result to divide an explicit algorithm to solve the consciousy problem for this uh, cyclical repetitive generalized free product. So, so here is it. I mean, in a nutshell, we have a generalized free product, and um, the, general, the generalized free product we, we deal with is obtained in a similar manner to that specified in uh, given the paper. So we have a free group on two generators, uh, round two, a non-trivial element in the free group U that, genera that generates its own centralizer, okay? And we have a free abelian group A of round two with an independent set, TV, of generators. And then we form the generalized free product, yes? Um, and through a constructed process, we will show that G is residually free and we'll utilize this property in devising an explicit algorithm for solving the conjugate problem in G. That is, recognizing when two elements are conjugate in G. Okay, so we're gonna use these two. So these are two. Excuse me, Anthony, can you? Theorem one, yes. Can you give us a little context for this? So this, these particular free products, tell us why, why people are interested in this particular free product. Well, I mean, it's, again, the, the, the word problem, the consciousness problem, and the isomorphism problem, these are all problems by, uh, you know, Max Den, yes, originally yeah. in 1911 or 12. And the idea is that uh, if we can solve the consciousness problem, if you, given the two elements in the group, can you tell whether or not they are conjugate? And uh, this is sometimes very difficult because of the structure of the group. And do these particular generalized free products have, are, are, they, are they particularly interesting for any reason? Um, well, it's complicated in the sense that we take in two things, we identify them by a subgroup, and so uh, probably in cryptography it probably uh, could be used in terms of uh, code, so certain things like this. Uh -huh. So if, the, if it's complicated to solve the country or, or even isomorphism problem, these things can be also used in public cryptography. Okay. But I'm not sure if no one is even using it because of the structure. Okay, um, thank you. And, and the reason for that is uh, you have the normal form, right? Of a particular, how you represent a word in this one from the first part and one from the second part, and it's non-trivial, mm -hmm. yes. Actually, so you have a, you have a hope. Actually, I think, uh, if you uh, if you can solve it for uh, for direct products and uh, that for free products and co-equalizers, you can solve it for all um, all coordinates in uh, the category of groups, and uh, this is some kind of step into from from the free products to s certain co-equalizers. Mm -hmm. So we compute uh, in that uh, step in that direction too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are. The theorem one and proposition one as from Gilbert paper. So it says that if let F be a free group, U belongs to an element of F, U is not a trivial element. Furthermore, if A is a free abelian group of countable infinite rank with an independent set X union V of generators, if U generates its own centralized in F, then the generalized free product is a subgroup of the Cartesian product of isomorphic copies of F. So the result of this theorem is basically saying that G is residually free. Yeah. Yes? Um, proposition 1 also says, so you're going to see how I kind of modify theorem 1 to suit the, 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 
my theorem or the theorem that I got from this to solve the generalized free product here. The, um, the conversion problem. So proposition one says, let k be a positive integer and f be a, a given a free group. Suppose that u, b1, b2, bk belongs to f. Furthermore, if this product is an equal to 1 for infinitely many integral values of n1, integral many values of n2, etc., up to nk, then there exists an i between 1 and k such that the u commutes with the bi's. Okay, so. <laughs> yes. Definition, well, everyone know what. How do you define a, a group to be relatively free? So we're using this idea. So the conclusion of theorem 1 in alternative ter terminology state that G, G is relatively free. So theorem 2 below spells out a specialized form of theorem 1. So with the restriction of generators, remember it was infinitely generated here, we restrict it to two generators. And the free abelian group again to two, rank two. So we'll sh show that this. Uh, still, if we restrict this to two generators and the free group and the free abelian group, then this group is rigidly free. So everything remains the same except we just, uh, instead of infinitely generated, we have run two. Do you get the same direct product that statement that you had before? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So here, F is a free group. U belongs to F. U is not the identity. U generates its own centralizer. A is a free abelian group on TV. And G is the generalized free product. Uh, we construct a map from G into F, onto F, such that we take F to F. And V goes to U. And T goes to U to the N. OK, so that's what this map does. N is a large positive integer. So by the nature of the generalized free product construction, uh, the map specified here, phi, um, extends to a homomorphism. Also denoted by phi, just a, a use of notation. So more about the images contained in F. And uh, given any element in G for a large choice, or a choice of large, a large positive with an N, we'll have, we'll be assured that the image is non-trivial. And for all G, we'll show that as a result of the definition of residually free, the group G will be residually free. But uh, the choices of N has to be very large, because if it's not, then the whole thing collapses. And the reason for that is this. If we, we have to consider four cases, where if U belongs to the subgroup, since uh, this is the subgroup is generated by U, right? The, the amalgam, we just have powers of I, U to the I. So we can tell if we choose an element G that is not the identity in F, then we can assure that except for the subgroup, phi of G is also not 1. Mm -hmm. uh, see that? Mm -hmm. um, then we go to the amalgam. If we choose a G belong, that belongs to the amalgam, then of course it's some power with U. So phi of U to the I is U to the I because the map said F to F. So of course the image again is not one. Uh, is this clear? Okay. And a part three, we can consider the case in which the element G is only in F and in A, but not in the amalgam. And that is the toughest case. Um, so an element of G is going to look at some power of V to the I, T to the J. Yes? Mm -hmm. Because, and so if we take an element, if we take an element in A minus uh, uh, G to the V, then if we look at a non-trivial element in G, which is written in this format, an alternating products, F1, A1, where F1 is in F minus the subgroup generated by U. A1 is in the subgroup in A minus the subgroup generated by U. Yes, so they are alternated products. Again, of course, four could have, we could have four different cases. Right? We could start with A, end with A, start with F, end with A, 
start with F and with F. But uh, it also works as well. So, um, so we take an trivial element G that has this format. If we take the image, what happens? Well, because of the construction, V goes to U. So that element V to the I will go to U to the I. And remember, T goes to U to the N. So everything going to be still be pushed into some U to some power, into F. And we can assure that for large N, because U do not commute with the F, because U generates its own centralizer, U do not commute with the F. And so uh, this product would, would, would be assured it's not one, because, well, there are several reasons. One of the reasons is, if it's equal to one, then it will satisfy the proposition that we had before, one. That the U must commute with the BIs. And it should show that U generates its own centralizer. So just U does not commute with the FIs. Yes? I have another question, Anthony. Sure. Um, this choice of N, how um, is there an algorithm to choose N? Uh, we well, know there exists an N. Correct. So we make the choice. Oh, there it is. Yes, that we make the choice so that it will be bigger than the absolute values of those I's. Oh, I see. Yeah. I missed that. Huh. So that would assure you that there is no cancellation. It, it wouldn't be U to I plus G would not be zero. That's the idea. We want it to be some much power larger than these, uh, these power I, I and G1. Mm, yes? Mm. So the key is that since U does not commute with F, then because of the, the converse of proposition 1, then this has to not be 1. Right? Mm. Remember proposition 1? Mm. Um, do you want to see mm. what it was? Or? Is that strange one? Yeah, that's a strange one. So um, this shows that uh, this group is rigidly free. So the idea here is that we're going to use this property to show that G, this, the congestion problem, is solvable for G. And we, so notice we, we kind of create this group in such a way that uh, we're going to use one of Magnus's theorem uh, to show, uh, as a blueprint, to show that this group that we just uh, constructed is rigidly, uh, the congestion problem is solvable. So, so we'll devise an algorithm that decides whether or not pairs of elements in G are conjugate in G. And we'll make use of this theorem by Fondian combinatorial group theory, uh, written by Magnus Corvass and Solitaire. So this is the, the theorem. We're going to use this as a blueprint. So now exactly, we know exactly how element sits in G. And we're going to use this given two elements, whether or not they are conjugate. And so this is a a very important theorem. I don't see people yeah. using this. I've never seen, but um, it, it kind of gives you a blueprint to solve the conjugate problem in general if you product as a whole actually. Um, okay, so it says this, that let G be, uh, this terms that let G be a, a generalized free product, then every element in G is conjugate to a cyclically reduced element in G. Uh, moreover, suppose G is cyclically, a cyclically reduced element then we have three cases. If G is conjugate to an element H in H, then G is in some factor, and there's a sequence, H1, H2 to Ht, and G, where H, I is in H, and consecutive terms of the sequence are conjugate in a factor. So if G is conjugate to an element G prime in some factor, but not in the conjugate of H, then G and G prime are in, this, in the same factor and conjugate in that factor. And the, set, the last, if G is conjugate to an element P to P1, where again P and P, P, P1, P2, P3, P3 alternate, alternate them, right, in the first, the first part, A, and P2 is in B, etc. That's the structure of this uh, general three product. Then for R greater than 2, that is for length greater than 2, as well as from PI to PI plus 1, uh, they are in distinct factors, that's what I'm saying, alternating. Um, then G 